You know, this is a, a very special honor and a privilege for the University of Guam to host uh, uh, our speaker this evening, our guest to the island. He's, um, uh, his uh, name will be in history books for decades to come. And uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of issues that are intended uh, to the whole issue of uh, marriage equality. And this is not, however, primarily a story about a legal right. Although the discussion has been about the laws and most of the discussion has been conducted uh, by lawyers and ultimately it will be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, this is not primarily a story about civil rights or more appropriately civil wrongs, although it has been labeled the civil rights issue of our time. If our time is now 2015 and a few years before and hence. Uh, this is not primarily a story about advocacy and activism, although without activism and without a strong network of support from advocacy organizations, it would be a very lonely and difficult road. This is ultimately a love story, an enduring story about two human beings, not quite two lovers leap, but the quest of two lovers who decided to take a leap of faith into a relationship that was foreclosed to them because both of them were males. For some of us to understand this, uh, we have to be rational beings who see this as a legal dispute. For others, it is a political dispute whereby we measure the strength of public opinion rather than personal conviction. For far too many, it is a difficult matter to ponder because it involves people that we know, people that we love, people that are in our families, people who are an extended network, and uh, people who are wanting to be human in the same way that we normally idealize uh, human relationships and romantic relationships as in Two Lovers Leap or Romeo and Juliet and for this evening John and Jim. Almost all of us can understand romance, a love story, and this is what makes Jim's story so compelling. The difference between love and the law is narrow and personal experience. All of us can understand human emotion even if we never went to law school. So enter Jim Obergefell, a German high school teacher for a couple of years and a real estate agent today. He met and fell in love with a man named John Arthur and they lived contently for over two decades until they decided to take advantage of an opportunity to give legal standing to their relationship. This was complicated by John's illness which was serious, ALS, known as Litico in Chamorro. Jim will share that story. No, he's not going to talk about second language requirements at UOG, in spite of the fact that he was a teacher of German. And no, he's not going to discuss the ravages of Lithico, even though I am sure he's very familiar with that. But he will discuss his personal journal in becoming an accidental activist as a result of a series of challenges and circumstances. Eventually, he found himself at the U.S. Supreme Court a few weeks ago, and he is now in Guam today. And this is a little bit about his situation as reported in the news. together for 20 years finally decided to get married this month because husband John Arthur is dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. I was in a relationship with John for almost 21 years. John was one of the funniest most well-spoken and charming people I've ever known. John and I met at a bar. A couple months later, John and his roommates were having a New Year's Eve party, and I went to the party and never left. 2011, John was diagnosed with ALS. The typical time frame is two and a half to five years before death. He was the love of my life. He was the person I committed to and would do anything for. We were watching the news, waiting for the Supreme Court decision to come out on Windsor, and the ruling was released, the decision read, and I just leaned over, hugged John, kissed him, and said, let's get married. 
We already felt married, and we wanted it to be a marriage that actually carried legal weight and legal respect. Ohio still does not recognize gay marriage. Other states do. Crossroads Hospice started to work with me to try to figure out how do we get John to Maryland, and very quickly realized a chartered medical jet was way beyond the budget. Because of our friends and family, the entire $13,000 cost of the medical jet was covered. Because they wanted us to get married and they wanted to be part of it. John Arthur passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease. Arthur and his same-sex partner, James Obergefell, were legally married in another state. A federal judge in Cincinnati heard final arguments in a fight over gay marriage in Ohio. At issue, whether same-sex marriages should be recognized on Ohio death certificates despite a statewide ban. To be told that John's last record as a person would forever be wrong, it's a horrible thing to hear. I couldn't think of a better thing to do, to live up to my vow. I do. They were married in Maryland and sued to have Jim named as surviving spouse on John's death certificate. It is a temporary order that compels Ohio to recognize their legal Maryland marriage. Each side says it is prepared to appeal and that next step will take this case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court rules in our favor, it's going to be just an incredible feeling of joy and of accomplishment more than anything I'm going to miss John. I really am. I'm going to wish you were here to know we won. HRC has just been phenomenal. This fight I'm in, they're on my side and they're there to help. It's not that they're fighting for special rights for us. They're just fighting for the same rights. I just hope that in June, if we do have marriage equality across the United States, that people don't suddenly decide, great, we've won. We have to make sure that we have the right to live our lives with the protections and the safety that all Americans should enjoy. It's all about equal rights, and marriage is a part of it, but it's not all of it. So we need to keep fighting. The fight for marriage equality, it's getting really close to being done. I look forward to everyone being able to marry the person they love and to have that marriage recognized. Ladies and gentlemen, Manelu Manayanaho, e amiguta e chiluta, our brother, Jim Oberta. Thank you everyone for being here. I, I really appreciate it. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this series. I'm very happy to be here on Guam for several reasons. One, it's an honor to be asked to share my story with you, especially as it relates to a local and national issue, marriage equality. Secondly, I've never been to Guam, and I'd love to see new places. And this really is a beautiful place, so thank you. And lastly, it's exciting for me to finally see a place I knew only through my father. Being here gives me a chance to remember and reconnect with him, and that's truly a gift. You see, my dad was a Navy CB during and after World War II, and he was stationed here on Guam. Like many veterans, and I imagine even tomorrow survivors from the war and occupation here on Guam, my father didn't talk much about his experiences here during the war, but I do know a bit about it. He spent a fair amount of time guarding Japanese prisoners, and his experience guarding them had what I think was an unexpected impact on how he viewed the world and other people. I remember my dad saying how surprised he was to discover that the prisoners weren't so very different from him. Guarding them gave him the opportunity to realize that no matter what preconceived notions he might have, people really are more similar than they are different. I believe that experience, that realization, informed his outlook for the rest of his life. I can't ever remember my dad talking about them versus us those people, 
or any of those things that indicated he was making any type of judgment or thinking of someone as less or different than he was. I like to think that I learned that from him. He was the kind of person who treated others with dignity, something I have come to know that Guamanians did not receive during that occupation. So I am grateful to my dad and all service members who helped liberate Guam. I was fortunate enough to be able to come out to my dad a few years before he died. His response? Jim, all I've ever wanted is for you to be happy. I believe his response is rooted in what he discovered about people, even people who seem so different, even enemies at war, while he served here on Guam. I feel it's something that I see embodied in Guam culture as well, a deep spirit of welcome and joy for and with others. So my dad loved me unconditionally. He was committed to me as a father, and he showed compassion to me at a time when, unfortunately, so many sons and daughters are judged and shown hatred instead of love. Love, commitment, compassion. These words resonate with me because they relate to my experience with my dad, my entire family, thankfully, and help explain why I find myself in the position I am. I never dreamed I would be able to legal marry, be able to legally marry, that I would one day file suit against the state of Ohio, or that I would be the named plaintiff in a landmark United States Supreme Court case, the case that could bring marriage equality to the entire United States this June. People tell me all the time that I've made a difference, that I'm helping make the world a better place. That's a really difficult thing for me to fully grasp. Growing up, I think we all hear stories about how one person really can make a difference in this world. I never personally really believed that. Well, I never really believed that I could be that person. It just didn't seem possible that I could impact anyone outside my family, outside my circle of friends, or the people I interacted with on a daily basis. I would be happy if I could have an impact on those people, but I simply could not fathom having an impact on a greater scale. Then I fell in love, and that simple act has led me to the United States Supreme Court. For me, my journey to this place began in 1992. I earned my undergraduate degree in secondary education in German a few years previously, and I was teaching high school German. In the summer of 1992, I quit my teaching job and moved away from Cincinnati, where I'd been for eight years, in order to attend graduate school at Bowling Green State University in Northern Ohio. Graduate school turned out to be the exact right decision for me at the right time. I'd struggled for years to understand and accept who I am. I realize now that by the age of eight, I had already figured out that I was different, but I wasn't able to define what that otherness was. That feeling of being different, of being other, continued through high school and into college. But by then, I finally had to work for it. I was gay. I opened that closet door a couple times during college, but I slammed it almost immediately. I just wasn't ready to admit to myself, let alone others, that I really was gay. I'm the baby of six in a Catholic family. My lot in life had always been to get married and have children. All of my siblings had done that. I had to as well, right? I saw no other possible way for my life to go. So I avoided being honest with myself and with others. Graduate school luckily changed that. The open, supportive environment I found in graduate school gave me the courage to finally admit to myself that I was gay. I remember being in a car with two of my graduate school friends, Cassandra and Matt, when Cassandra asked Matt and me if we were gay or straight. Matt answered immediately, gay. I found myself sitting in the back seat, feeling scared and having a very quick internal conversation. I asked myself, Jim, are you going to lie? Or are you going to take this chance to start a new life and be honest with yourself and with others? I finally answered, gay. The secret was out. I was finally out. I had no idea being open and honest could feel so good. 
Shortly after that, I started coming out to my family and friends. My mom had died seven years earlier, and I regret that I was never able to completely open myself up to her. But I still had a lot of people to tell. I told my dad. He was the first family member I told, and I already told you how he responded. My entire family reacted in much the same way, and I realized how incredibly fortunate I am. I experienced no rejection, and my family never once tried to change who I am. I spent a couple months coming out to my family and friends, and for the first time in my life, I actually felt comfortable in my own skin. A few months later, love and commitment changed my life when I fell in love with John. For John and me, it wasn't love at first sight, but instead love at third sight. We met the first time at a bar, but it was just one group of friends meeting another group of friends. No sparks flew, nothing changed for either one of us. We met a second time at the same bar. This time, John was with his friend Melissa. He had taken her out that evening to teach her how to talk to men. Just like the first time we met, nothing happened and no sparks flew. Well, Melissa actually noticed something. Later that evening, she, she and John talked about it. Hey, John, that guy liked you. What guy? Jim, Kevin's friend. No, we barely know each other. He doesn't like me. No, John, he likes you. So clearly, I made a really good impression. So Melissa saw something that night. Because the third time John and I met, everything changed. One of John's housemates invited me to a New Year's Eve party at John's house. I went to that party, the sparks finally flew, and I never left. After six months of a long-distance relationship, I moved back to Cincinnati from graduate school, and we built, started to build our life together. We quickly became inseparable. I introduced John to my family. He introduced me to his family. We were warmly welcomed into each other's family and without any issues. We made friends, we traveled, we got involved in our community, bought a home. We worked together. Over the course of our 20 years as a couple, we worked together at four different companies doing the same exact job. We made commitments to each other. We promised to love, honor, and protect one another. We promised that we would always put each other's needs above our own. Above our own. We promise to always be there for one another. Love and commitment. Again, those were common themes during our 20 years together. The promises we made, the commitments we made, were no different than those any other couple makes. However, we were prevented from making them public and legal. We wanted to. In the mid-90s, when Hawaii flirted with marriage equality, John's stepmother said, I'm going to take everyone to Hawaii if it passes so that you guys can get married. Well, we know how that worked out. It never happened. We continued to talk about marriage over our time together, but we never seriously considered it because we wanted it to be more than symbolic. We wanted it to carry legal weight. We felt married. All of our family and friends considered us married. And until our government would recognize our marriage, we decided we would not wed. John's aunt Paulette, however, is a very hopeful person. She always told us that, in her opinion, we were much more of a married couple than any other couple she knew. Because of that, she went online and clicked the Ordain Me button, because she wanted to be ready to marry us should we ever, ever have that opportunity. In 2004, Ohio passed a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage or the recognition of out-of-state same-sex marriages. We thought that was the end of the marriage discussion, at least for us in Ohio. So we just continued living our lives and loving each other. We continued just fulfilling all of those promises we made to one another. Life did take an unexpected and most unwelcome turn in 2011 after 18 years together. That winter, I'd noticed John's left foot was slapping when he walked. His gait had changed. It sounded different. Initially, we thought, Maybe he'd sprained his ankle or pulled a muscle. But the slapping never went away. Then John admitted that he had started falling. Every so often. And he also admitted that he was having difficulty getting into and out of our small car. So I finally convinced him to go to our family doctor. She did test, then referred him to a neurologist. 
diagnosis was ALS. He went to a second neurologist who concurred ALS. ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progressive neurological disease with no cure, and most patients die within two to five years of diagnosis. Our world was turned upside down. Yet John reacted to this terrible news with the same positive attitude he always had about life. He was one of those people who saw life as a glass half full. In fact, at the second appointment when the second neurologist concurred with the diagnosis of ALS, John was wearing one of his favorite t-shirts. A Life is Good brand shirt with the drawing of a glass partially filled with water and the phrase half full. Even for that appointment, which was one of the scariest things for him to ever go to, he still kept that attitude and looked at life as a glass half full. I later started a walk to defeat ALS team in John's honor, and because of his attitude, I named it Team Half Full. John never once complained, never once felt sorry for himself. I kind of took that on. I did all the complaining. <laughs> One thing we didn't do, we didn't run, and we didn't hide from ALS. We didn't pretend it wasn't happening. We planned ahead, and we made changes. The condo we lived in at the time was two levels, and the building itself wasn't handicap friendly. So we started looking for a new home. When we found the one that we wanted, John insisted that the new condo be in only my name. He wanted to make sure that we avoided any potential issues at the time he died. We bought a small SUV to make it easier for John to get into and out of the car. We made sure our wills and all of those other legal documents like powers of attorney that other couples don't have to worry about. We made sure those were set and in place and up to date. And we also planned what to do to celebrate John at the time he died. We were fortunate. We were able to plan ahead. We loved each other and we continued to live up to those commitments we had made. Our family and friends helped us through by showing us their love and their compassion. Again, those three concepts, love, commitment, and compassion, kept us going. John's physical decline, unfortunately, continued. He started using a cane in the summer of 2011, and in 2012, he started using a walker. By December of 2012, he was using a power wheelchair. By that point, he had lost almost all of his abilities on the left side of his body, and most of his abilities on the right. I was his full-time caregiver, feeding him, cleaning him, lifting him, and moving him, doing everything possible for him. John watched himself lose every ability every single day, and yet his mind was as sharp as ever. One of his most wonderful gifts, his way of speaking, and his wit was starting to be impacted. Luckily, ALS did not rob John of his ability to speak early on like so many other patients, but he was now finding it more difficult to speak more than a few sentences at a time, and his speech was slurred. In March of 2013, he began at-home hospice care. He was now bedridden, unable to do much more than move his right hand, turn his head, and speak a few sentences. The hospice nurses cared for him four hours a week. I was still his caregiver for the remaining time. I never expected to be a caregiver before the age of 40, especially not for the love of my life. But it really was a privilege to care for him. I can think of no better way to live up to your promises and commitments and to show your love and compassion than to care for someone. It wasn't easy, and it certainly was not fun. But it was for the person I cared the most about, and it was simply the right thing to do. On June 26, 2013, John and I were watching MSNBC, waiting for the Supreme Court decision on the Windsor case to be announced. Finally, the news came out, and the Supreme Court had found part of the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. Without thinking, I simply leaned over, hugged and kissed John, and said, let's get married. At that moment, for the first time in our 20 years together, our government was saying that relationships like ours mattered, that they existed. We finally had the chance to marry and for it to carry legal weight, at least at the federal level. And luckily, John said yes, 
I reached out to Aunt Paulette to ask if she would marry us, and of course she said yes. So her decision years previously to click ordain me on the internet proved to be the right thing to do, and we were thrilled. Now unfortunately, I couldn't simply take John the six blocks to our county courthouse to get a marriage license and then marry in the comfort and safety of our home. That Ohio constitutional amendment made that impossible. So we knew we would have to leave Ohio in order to get married. So I immediately started planning. Where could we marry and how would I get John there safely and comfortably? We initially thought about New York, mainly because it was the closest in distance. And a friend's aunt in Cincinnati married her wife there, so we liked having someone we could talk to who had been through the process. But then I realized putting John in the back of an ambulance for more than 700 miles would just be punishing on him physically. And I wasn't willing to put him through that much pain and discomfort. So that meant our option was to fly. There was no way John could fly commercially, however. So we had one option left, and that was chartering a medical jet. I didn't start looking to that just yet, because first I needed to figure out where we were going to go. So I started researching all the states where we could marry, and then a friend who grew up in Maryland said, hey Jim, have you thought about Maryland? And I hadn't looked at Maryland at that point, so I changed gears and started to look, look at Maryland. And I discovered one very important thing. Maryland is one state where both people do not have to appear in person to apply for the marriage license. One person can do that. So I realized this was a perfect solution. I could go to Maryland in advance, apply for the marriage license. We wouldn't have to worry about flying John out and then finding a place to stay. A few days later, John and I could then fly together. But John's hospice provider has a program that they call the gift of the day. And the point of this is to treat their patients with an event, an activity, something. And it could be something that that patient has always loved to do or something that they have always wanted to do but have never been able to. So the hospice service will plan an outing, plan an activity, and treat that patient to that. So I asked hospice if they would consider helping out with our marriage as John's gift of the day. Now, no surprise, the hospice service does have a budget for each gift of a day, and they quickly realized a medical jet was way beyond that. But what they could do was pay for the ambulance service from home to the airport and back. So I started contacting medical jet charter services. If you've never looked into this, it's really expensive. And I took to Facebook. And I went to Facebook simply to ask for connections, ask for help. So I posted on Facebook just asking if any of my friends knew a pilot or someone connected with a charter jet service. I thought, you know, so many things in life, it's the personal connections, the people you know that can make things happen. What I didn't expect to happen was for my family and friends to say, Jim, you know, we don't know anyone, but we want to be part of your marriage. We want you and John to get married. So please, accept this gift of money. No questions asked. We want to help you make this happen. And because of their generosity, the entire $13,000 cost of that medical jet was covered. Again, love and compassion saved the day. So on July 11, 2013, we rode in an ambulance to the airport. We boarded this small jet with Aunt Paulette, a nurse, and two pilots. Less than an hour later, we landed at Baltimore Washington International Airport. We parked on the tarmac, Aunt Paulette performed the ceremony, and we were finally officially married. It really was the most beautiful moment of my life. Less than 45 minutes after landing, we were back in the air and heading home to Cincinnati. We shared a bottle of champagne, we held hands, and we simply reveled in being married. We landed in Cincinnati only to be surprised by family and friends waiting on the tarmac. Again, they wanted to be part of our wedding, and they wanted to be there to welcome us home, to welcome the newlyweds home to Cincinnati. I find it impossible to explain or describe why that act of marriage could change our 20-year relationship or how we felt about one another, but it did. We suddenly felt better. We felt different. 
more complete. And if possible, we loved each other more. And I think over the next several days, we must have said the word husband at least a few hundred day, times a day. That weekend, our local paper, the Cincinnati Inquirer, published a story about us, John's illness, and our marriage. Friends were at a party that same weekend, and they ran into a friend of theirs, a civil rights attorney, Elgar Hardstein. Our story came up in conversation. <clears throat> Al, hearing our story, told me later that he's thinking, John and Jim have a problem, and they don't realize it. So Al asked our friends if they thought we'd be interested in meeting with them. They got in touch with me and said, Al would like to meet you. Are you interested? So we said, okay, come on, come on over. So we got married on Thursday. On Monday, we met Al. And during that first meeting, our attorney pulled out a blank death certificate. He put it on the table and pointed out two things on that form. One was marital status at time of death, and the other surviving spouse name. Guys, do you realize when John dies, the state of Ohio will put single in marital status, and they will leave the surviving spouse field blank. Jim, your name won't be there. And John's last record as a person, his last official record, will be wrong. That's a very painful thing to hear four days after you've been married. And Al was right. We hadn't thought about that. We were still celebrating and enjoying being married after 20 years together. <clears throat> Who thinks about a death certificate at the time you've gotten married? We certainly hadn't. We hadn't even thought about what Ohio would do or how Ohio would react to our marriage, let alone what John's last record would be. So it was an easy decision for us. We decided right then and there we weren't willing to accept being second-class citizens any longer. We didn't think any other couple should be treated that way either. So we filed suit in federal court four days later on July 19, 2013, and that was the very first marriage equality case filed in the U.S. after the Windsor decision. Three days later, July 22, 2013, I sat in the United States Federal District Court and listened to our attorney argue our case in front of Judge Timothy Black. Later that same day, Judge Black issued a ruling in our favor and he put in place a temporary injunction forcing the state of Ohio to complete John's death certificate accurately by recognizing our marriage at the time he died. The outpouring of love and support following our story and lawsuit was stunning. We heard from people from around the world. Cards, letters, artwork, handshakes, hugs, thank yous, stories, laughter, and tears. It was amazing to discover just how much our story touched people, to learn that people really did feel a connection with us, and to feel their compassion. We experienced overwhelming support that far outweighed the one, and only one, negative we received, an anonymous letter filled with Bible verses, hatred, and condemnation. When John died three months later, he died knowing his death certificate would be completed accurately, showing him as married and listing me as his surviving spouse. And I know that gave him some comfort. Agreeing to this lawsuit, to this fight, was a way for him to thank me for caring for him. And it was also his way to live up to his promises to love, protect, and honor me. In December of that year, Judge Black made the injunction permanent, and the state of Ohio immediately filed an appeal to the 6th District Court of Appeals. Our case was consolidated with five other cases, right to marry cases and recognition cases from Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Michigan. And these six cases span our entire life as a person. Our case represents the end of life, and the rights and dignity we and our survivors deserve at death. Many of the other cases represent the start of life and the dignity and rights that all parents and children deserve. The dignity of having an accurate birth certificate that reflects the child's parents and the rights and protections both parents deserve. Many of those other plaintiffs have now become my friends. Kelly and Kelly, Pam and Nicole, Joe and Rob, Greg and Michael. 
They are committed couples and loving, devoted parents. And their children deserve accurate records that list both parents. These couples should not be forced to decide which parent is the legally recognized parent and which parent is, in essence, a legal stranger with lesser rights. Their children should not live in fear of what happens to them should their legally recognized parent die. These parents should not have to carry legal documents with them at all times to prove who they are. And the parents should never have to consider or worry about, at times of crisis, which parent takes the child to a hospital. That's what we're fighting for. Respect, rights, and responsibilities. We're simply fighting to be treated exactly the same as any other couple. The Sixth District Court of Appeals heard arguments in our six cases in August of 2014, and in November, the court ruled against us. Although it was devastating to lose at the appeals court level, there was a silver lining. This ruling created a split in the appeals courts. The Sixth District Court of Appeals was the only appeals court to rule against marriage equality, and our hope at that point was that the United States Supreme Court would now take up the issue. We appealed to the United States Supreme Court, and in January of this year, they agreed to hear all six cases. And in March, they announced that all six cases would be consolidated into one that would be known as Obergefell v. Hodges, because our case was the first to be filed. I sat in the United States Supreme Court on April 28th, just a few short weeks ago, listening to the oral arguments. Let me set the scene for you. Picture a rectangular courtroom that's smaller than you expect. There's a decorative white plaster ceiling, a series of recessed squares with florets in the center, and the background of each square is painted red, white, or blue. Below the ceiling, there's a carved stone frieze with Greek-style figures. The walls are not dark paneled wood like I always imagined, but pale limestone or marble. Ionic columns ring the room with dark red drapes and gold fringe hanging between. Wooden seats fill the room, and there are extra seats squeezed into every available space. This still doesn't seem real to me. It's like I'm experiencing it through someone else's eyes. How can I really be here in the United States Supreme Court? I sit next to Aunt Paulette. Luckily, she was able to be there with me, and that gives me a sense of comfort. Chatting with the people sitting around me before arguments begin, I'm once again reminded how much people are affected by our story about my life and love with John. The young man seated in front of me, when he realized who I am, immediately burst into tears. Every time he turned toward me during the arguments, his eyes were red and brimming with tears. This young man felt love for me, for me and for John. The man sitting next to me tells me that my story really had an impact on someone today. He explains how his twin brother, a Roman Catholic priest, called him that morning to say he had watched a video about the named plaintiff in this case. And the video touched him deeply and made him cry. The same man later told me that it wasn't only his twin brother who was affected by my story, but he was as well. And this man is an evangelical Republican. He shook my hand and thanked me. I experienced compassion from someone I never expected. A buzzer sounds almost like it's lunchtime at school. We all rise, the red curtains are drawn back, and there stand the nine Supreme Court justices. There's a sense of theater about this room, about the proceedings. Everyone sits and oral arguments begin. If you haven't already, listen to the arguments or read the transcript. Then read what others much smarter than I have to say about what happened. I am hopeful about marriage equality, but I'm not taking anything for granted. I know the decision in June could be anything. The last five minutes of the oral arguments are when our attorney is able to rebut the state regarding the right to recognition of lawful out-of-state marriages. At that point, our attorney says my name and John's name and tells our story. He talks about our simple wish to have our death, John's death certificate be accurate. 
I start to cry, and I grab Aunt Paulette's hand. This is the first time that entire day that I really feel like I'm there in the United States Supreme Court. It's suddenly real to me. Our attorney does nothing but talk about John's and my love and the commitments we made to each other and our simple request to have that recognized and treated with respect. As we file out of that courtroom, I think about a word I heard very frequently during oral arguments. Tradition. I think about that word and I can't help but hope that those nine Supreme Court justices reflect on and rule in accordance with the tradition that's carved into the pediment above the front door of that building. And this is the tradition that truly matters. Equal justice under law. As the other plaintiffs and I walked down those famous Supreme Court steps and the thousands of people gathered in support realized we were there, the crowd let loose the great roar. It stunned me. And I cried. In that moment, I missed my husband more than I had in a very long time. John and I started this fight almost two years ago, and it started from a very personal place. After more than 20 years together, we simply wanted our marriage to matter. We wanted our government to recognize and respect our relationship, our lawful marriage. It doesn't seem possible that our simple decision to stand up for our rights has led to this place, this point in time. My name and face will forever be tied to what has become a landmark civil rights case, but I don't think I'll ever quite get used to that. I have, however, finally come to believe that one person can make a difference. We made that decision out of love for one another and to live up to our commitments. It's a privilege to be part of this fight for marriage equality. And the love and compassion I've experienced from around the country prove again and again that we made the right decision. If I could go back to that Monday in July 2013 when we met our attorney for the first time, I would make the same decision to fight the state of Ohio, even knowing now that John would die just three months later. It was simply the right decision. I can think of no better way for me to honor John and our marriage than to continue this fight. Yes, I'm hopeful that we'll get good news in June. News that will take us one step closer to the promise of equality enshrined in our Constitution. News that will impact me in Cincinnati and you here on Guam. My hope is that on the day the decision is released, someone will be inspired to do what I did on that day in 2013 when the Windsor decision was announced. Propose to the love, to the love of his or her life. And that a community or even an island, will rise up around them in love and support. That simple act of love and commitment and the compassion I've been shown is truly what this fight is about. I've heard that legend about on Guam of two lovers whose love was forbidden and disdained by their families and communities, so much so that they decided to throw their bodies from a cliff here on Guam, a place where today couples from around the world commemorate their love and commitment. I wonder if you have loved ones who feel the unbearable fear of not being accepted just because of whom they love. We're at a point right now together where we can provide hope to our loved ones who, are, who may be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender by fully accepting them, not just as valuable members of our family, but also by protecting them in the legal framework of our laws. Like the story that, played, that placed two lovers on that cliff above Tuman Bay, we have a choice today on this island and across the country to stand on the side of love and on the right side of history. I know that John's and my souls are entwined forever in love, in life, and now in death. I'm humbled to think that our story, our love, is having an impact far beyond anything we could have ever dreamed. It's truly my honor to be here on Guam and share my story. Thank you.